Glad you guys are joining us. I want to say hello to all of our campuses. Thanks for being a part of our services today. I do want to start a little different today. I want to stop and pray for Israel. I believe we should do that right now. Ask God's hand upon them. And uh, also, I'm really proud. I want to also say this. If you've been watching the news at all, I don't know if you caught it, but our military is also involved in helping protect Israel. I'm really proud to say that of our military. Let's give it up for our military. We're so thankful for all you do. Grateful. Let's pray real quick. God, we just lift up Israel right now. God, we pray for protection over them. God, thank you, Lord, that your hand is with them. God, I pray, Lord, just for just strategic miracles that we don't even need to know about, God, that you're just doing things on the ground, that people are just getting information before anything happens, Lord, so they can prepare and protect. And God, I pray that you would just line up the people, the resources, the connections, just to guard your holy land, Father. Thank you, God, that we can stand with them. And Lord, we do stand with them and pray, God, your blessings over them, Father. In your name we pray. Now, God's people said... Amen, amen. Thanks for letting me do that. Yeah, believe in that. So glad you guys are here. We've been in this series on learning to wait well. You know, we all have a waiting uh, in our lives. Some, someone's waiting on something. Maybe you're waiting on a job opportunity, a, a door to open, the right relationship to happen. I don't know what you're waiting for, but we all have something. I'm waiting for my daughter to finish college, so I'm going to pay all this money. I'm waiting. You know, we all have a wait, right? And so we all have some kind of wait, but God always comes through in the middle of that wait. There was a, a husband and a wife, uh, they went shopping, and they're at the mall, and, and the wife says, hey, let's split up, and we'll meet back at this time right here, right? So they go shop a little bit. She comes back a couple hours later and meet, to meet her husband. He's not there. He's not there 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later. She's like, where is he? Finally, she calls him. He's like, hey, where are you? He goes, oh, baby, I'm really sorry. You know where that jewelry store is that we went in years ago and you fell in love with that diamond necklace that I said, man, I wish I could pay for it now. I just don't have the money, but maybe one day I can buy it for you. She's like, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, I'm in the pub right next door to there. That's where I'm at, just letting you know. <laughs> Sometimes you still have to wait. So anyways, I just want to encourage you that we all have a wait on something, right? We're all waiting for something to happen. Well, there's a guy in the Bible that was spoken over that God told him he would be the next king. And this is David. We're talking about David, but I want to talk not about King David today. I want to talk about Kid David today. What do you do when you're told something, but it seems like it's taken forever to get here? David had to wait over two decades before it actually happened, what was spoken over him. So I want to unpack what he did in the in-between. So we're going to talk about what David did as a kid. Then we're going to skip over the great story. I know it's hard to do that, but we're going to skip over the great story about David and Goliath. I want to share one more piece of information before he became king. And so I'm excited about today's message. You guys ready to go? Oh, you can do better than that. You guys ready to go? All right. This is an interactive service. I need some energy. I need some amens. I need someone to get excited. Is that cool? This is an interactive service. All right, let's do that. All right, I can hear you at the campuses too. Come on, let me hear you right now. Oh, wait, wait, I can't hear you. Rockport Fulton, can I hear you? Let's give it up for all these guys. Rockport Fulton, Rod Field. Stone Oak, come on. Portland, let's go, Portland. Padre Island, let's go. Come on, Rockfield. We want to hear from you, and so let's get going. Okay, let's jump into the scripture today. Here's the part of the story where, where a guy named Samuel, he's a prophet, God speaks to him and says, hey, God's hand, he says, my hand is no longer on Saul, but I want to anoint another young man who's going to become the next king, and he says, go to a guy named Jesse's home. So he's like, okay. So he goes to Jesse's house to anoint the next king. Jesse hears of this. He's freaked out. Like, why is Samuel here? Samuel's a really important guy. He walks with God. He's the prophet of Israel. And they say, he's here to anoint one of your, one of your sons to be next king. So he gets all sons and lines them up. Everyone but David. He says, David, he says, you stay out in the field. Watch all the sheep for everyone while everyone else is lined up. And so here's what happens in Scripture. It's 1 Samuel 16, 10. The Lord has not chosen any of these. Are these all the sons you have? This is what Samuel says. There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. Now, this is, of course, one of the most powerful moments in David's life. And it's easy for us to immediately shift and say, wow, he's about to be anointed the next king. But I want you to imagine, you hear later that your dad is told that one of the boys are going to be the next king, and you're not even invited to the party. Think about that for a second. He's like, I mean, Dad, could you at least pretend like I'm king worthy? Could you at least just act like it, even though you probably think the oldest is going to be picked, because that's how all of us would have thought if we would have had the mind of an ancient Israel in this day and time. It's going to be the firstborn. We would have thought that. But isn't it like God, by the way, to always pick the run of the family? Isn't it like God to pick the one that's the least 
the least one that you think. And isn't that good to know God? God always does that, right? He picks someone who is, doesn't feel like they're deserving. And so I, I love how God does that. He doesn't pick the qualified. He qualifies the picked. And so God has a, a word for David. He's about to speak to him. But this is really important, and I want to encourage you today, if this is you today, would you write this down? Often right before a strong anointing is a strong rejection. David gets rejected by his own dad. Now, I'm not saying Jesse's a bad father because I've been the father who has said things and done things I regret too. All of us as fathers, if you're a father, you know you, you've, you've got some moments you're not proud of. And so I don't know any dad who, who, who would say, oh, I've always got it right, always nailed it. No, nope, it's just not true. And so Jesse's actually a good dad. There's later on times where we see he's a good father towards all his kids. But in this moment, oh, he made a big mistake. He did not invite David to the party. I'm sure David's offended. I'm sure he's frustrated, like, what in the world's going on? Now, it was quickly overshadowed because he was anointed to be the next king, but this had to hurt. I want to encourage you today that when you're young, if you go through a big betrayal or a rejection, something painful that happened to you, that's not a sign that God's hand's not on you. It's a sign that God's hand is on you. Because how can you lead the group that you're in so he has you rejected from the group so you can become the leader of the group? God's setting you apart to do great things. So I just want to encourage you that an early rejection is a good thing. God uses this in your life. Because when you get hurt, you have a tendency to look up and say, why me? And God's saying, because I'm trying to get your attention, trying to get your eyes on me. And so God uses this in your life. I remember uh, hearing a true story about Walt Disney, uh, the actual guy, not the company. Uh, he started a small uh, company, a, a cartoon company, and it was stolen from him through a series of business moves. It was completely taken from him, all his artists, all the money, everything. And he referred back to that years later when he was very successful with the Walt Disney Company, eventually the theme parks, the whole thing. And he said, I think everyone needs a good burn early in life because it serves you well. It's really true. I just want to encourage you, that, that is a good thing. I always try to remind pastors and church planters when they call me, man, you look at, it's like everything you touch turns to gold. I'm like, I mean, that's so far from the truth, it's ridiculous. And I remind them, this is my second church plant. The first one closed its doors. I know all about failure. I just want to encourage you that if you want God to use you greatly, listen, before God uses you greatly, he, he wounds you deeply. And he will use that wound in your future. And so if you've gone through something, and by the way, it's not just once, but every time God begins a new trajectory in my life and my ministry, I've seen it where I've been burned, and then right after that, God opened a great door. So just be encouraged today. God's not trying to hurt you. He's setting you up for a victory. He's setting you up for something big. Someone get excited because God, God has big plans for you. He does. He does. Look what happens next. So now David's finally being invited to the party. He gets cleaned up. He's before Jesse. This is what happens. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. Mm. Reminds me of a young Bill Cornelius. <laughs> I wonder what you're laughing about. Anyways. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, that's important. He does it in front of his brothers. Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed David with oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Now, there's so many layers of this, but today, if it's okay with you, I'd like to, to, to just acknowledge a, kind of a new stage God has me in, and that's that I'm, I'm a little older now as a pastor. You know, for years, I was kind of like up, young, up-and-coming pastor. Well, I'm 51 now. I'm a grandfather now, glad to be, by the way, and I'm loving life. It's so much fun. But one of the only advantages of being older, right, there's plenty of disadvantages we could talk about. Oh, I got this ache and pain here and this and that, right? Got all that. But one of the great advantages is I believe God's called me to speak to you as a father today. So if that's okay, can I do that? And so I want to talk to you like I talk to my kids. And so because, you know, when, when you talk, a good father talks to their kids and tells them things that maybe aren't so obvious that they need to hear. And there's a lot of that in this scripture that I want to point out today. One of the things I want to point out here is that David is anointed in front of his brothers. So as an older guy now, as a guy sort of in the older generation, and I'll let you define whether you are or not, it's important if you have some age and maturity behind you, you've been walking with the Lord for a while, it's important that we recognize that one of the roles that we have now is to put our hands on someone when God speaks to us. Not all the time, I'm not saying indiscriminately, but when God puts it on your heart, 
it's important to stop them and let them know what you see in their life. This is such a critical thing. How many of you guys had someone do that in your life? Someone, when you were young, came along, put their hand on you and said, I see this in you. You've got greatness in you. How many of you guys have someone? See, the problem is, the reason we don't recognize it early on is because they don't have a badge that says prophet. But let me tell you what prophet looks like when you're young. It looks like a Sunday school teacher, a youth minister, a coach, a teacher, maybe an older brother or sister that was maybe almost a generation older than you. So they were almost like another father or mother to you. Maybe for you, it was, it was an uncle or aunt that walked with God, and they just took a moment to tell you something. Maybe for you, the prophecy came in a warning, saying you're going in the wrong direction, but you've got great things in you. And that's important, too, because prophets also warn people. Remember, the same prophet that anointed David took the anointing off of Saul. So both are important. But I want to encourage you that we've all had someone like that in our life. I had a guy in my life named Eddie. Eddie was not my youth pastor. He was a former youth pastor that was an associate pastor at our church. I have a great youth minister, too, and I love him dearly, and he meant a lot to me as well. His name is Mick. But Eddie did something for me that was really special. He just pulled me aside. He could tell us at struggling. He's like, hey, how are you doing? I'm okay. And he could just tell I wasn't doing well. And he said, why don't you come meet with me this week? Sat down with me, began to pour into my life. That began a relationship that I've had with Eddie now for, gosh, 30, 30 almost 40 years now. And I will tell you this. Eddie said some things to me that have proven true years later. Eddie's now retired. He was in ministry for a long time. And I hope he's watching this today because I want to tell you, Eddie, because of your words, there is now a church of ten to 15,000 people that are being blessed and ministered to because you told me I had something in me, and I'm thankful for you. We need people like that in our life. And also, as a father, I want to make sure that God doesn't have to bring a prophet over me to say what I should be saying to my kids. Does that make sense? Now, here's the thing. Both are important. It's important for me as a father to speak to my kids, but I also am praying that God would bring other people outside of my voice to speak into my kids too. So I just want to encourage you as an older generation that we should be speaking into the next generation. Let them know when you see something. Again, only if you see it, but if you do, just put your hands on them, square them up, look them down and say, I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. I see this in you. God has greatness and you're going to do good things. Don't be discouraged. Let me tell you what I see in you. And then speak what you see in their life over them and watch them thrive. This will take you two minutes, but it could change the trajectory of their life. And also when you're younger, when someone has spoken those words over to you, something like that, don't blow that off. We have a tendency to ignore that and listen to the world instead. But God has brought people in your life to speak over you. I'm going to show you another scripture on this. Proverbs 3.27. This is for all of us who need to speak over someone today. It says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Let me say it another way. When God tells you something about someone, it's in your power to speak it, say it to them. Pull them aside. And so one of my favorite things I get to do sometimes is in the atrium, just grab a hold of them and say, hey, hold on, come here. I, want to tell you, I see something big in you. God has something great in your life. Listen, every kid has a king or queen inside them waiting to come out. And we can speak that out of them. We can make such a dare. Change my life, and you can change someone else's life. Speak it over them. If you will do this, I promise you, you will be a world changer because you'll change someone's world. So speak it over them. I'm so passionate about this. I just really believe that God wants someone to hear that today. And maybe no one did, you say, Pastor, no one did that for me. Well, then let me say it for you. You have greatness in you. You have more in you. You are not what happened to you, and you're not what you did. You're what God says you are. You can do great things. You need to receive that. Take hold of that promise and hold on to it during the hard times. Say, no, I've been spoken over. I know what God has for me. And begin to see that happen in your life. Let's keep moving. What happens next? This is important. It says, now the spirit of the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry, let me say this real quick. Number two, anointing is different from a dream. I want to point this out. This isn't what David was dreaming. It was what he was spoken over. Anointing is different than a dream. It's from outside of you, normally spoken over you. This is important. It's great to have a dream, but when you have a dream and God comes and speaks over you something that matches that dream, that gets exciting. You're like, okay, this is confirmation of what God's been putting in my heart. So you want to look for that. But, but if someone's speaking something over you that maybe doesn't quite line up with your dream, I want to encourage you, if they're walking with God, listen to them. Let that steer you. God will lead you in that direction if you'll listen to it. I had key people in my life do that for me. And we all need that, and we all need to do that for others as well. Okay, let's keep going. This is important. Look what happens next. 
now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. The word there for fear, also in the original Greek language, is paranoia. There's nothing worse than a paranoid leader. A paranoid leader is someone who's always like, what did they say about me? What they, who's talking? I want to know who it is. That's a paranoid leader. And so if you're leading, don't become paranoid. That's, that, that's, um, that's the death knell to the end of your leadership. So, you know, you say, but, but I know there's staff talking or, or personnel talking or employees talking or I got friends talking. And, and the answer I have to say to that is it's none of your business what they're saying. People always talk bad about the boss. People always talk bad about leaders. You don't, don't worry about that. Just don't give that the time of day. Listen to what God has to say about you and the direction he's leading you. If you want to be a leader, you can't be caught up in the opinions of others. And so can I just say, can I mention something? I mentioned in the last service, I want to just say this. If you need them emotionally, if you need them, you can't lead them. So you, you got to make a decision. Your mom or dad, you, you're not supposed to be their friend. You're their mom and you're their dad. Don't be their friend. Be their leader. Whether they like you or not, lead them well. Make sense? It's so important. Last week I said some pretty tough things. It was the right thing. It's what leadership demands of me. So I want to challenge you. Just do what God leads you to do. If you need the people you're leading, you can't lead them there. You can't need them emotionally. Let me keep going. This is important. The Spirit of the Lord left Saul. A tormenting spirit came upon him. He became very paranoid. He says, some of Saul's servants said to him, let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. Well, guess who plays the harp? David. So God created a need in Saul that David could fill. Now, before this happens, though, before David, you know, gets a call from his dad who got a call from, you know, from the king, before he knows any of that, David didn't know this is happening. So this is important. So David, he's anointed to be the next king. Like, oh, this is like the moment, right? This is like amazing. Like, oh my goodness, he's under porn oil. I'm like, what's going on? This is crazy. This is a really important person for him. My dad keeps bowing to him. It must be a big deal. Everybody says he's the prophet of Israel. He just told me I'm the next king. Guess what happens after that? Congratulations, David. Now go back and watch the sheep. Nothing else changed in David's life. So David now has this great word from God, but nothing's changing. Why in the world would God let you be spoken over and then your job doesn't change, your family doesn't get better, you don't get a raise, the doors don't start flinging open? Why, why, would, God, why would God let me be spoken over and nothing else change? Because God's trying to change you right now. He doesn't need anything else to change. If God changes you, then you'll change everything else. So, and, and the reason why I want to bring this up, because some people, you're, you're like, waiting. I'm waiting on God to open this door. And God, God said, no, I'm waiting on you to get that I've got a word for you. I'm waiting on you to get that you're anointed. I'm waiting on you to understand that I've got great things for you to do. Because if you don't believe that, I can fling all kinds of doors open. You won't do anything with it. And so God's not going to put you in a new situation with an old you. Because an old you will do what you're doing now. So God wants to make you new. He wants to renew our minds. He says it in Romans. He wants to get you thinking differently about yourself. So he renews you, and then you change your job into a career. And then you change your, your prospects because all of a sudden you're different, and people see it. That guy's going somewhere. You can tell by the way they act that they're moving somewhere. That girl has got a promise of God on her life. And I can tell by the decisions she's making, they're different than decisions she used to make. And so God changes you first before he changes your situation. Quit asking God to change your situation. God says, I'm going to change you. That changes everything else. So what happens? This is really important. Number three, trust that God is moving on your behalf even when you don't see it. So a lot of times, nothing changes. You just got a word from God, but nothing else seems to change. But it doesn't mean God's not moving. The other day, I went to the dentist. I need to get some work done. I love going to my dentist. It's the only place I can get high. And so, <laughs> it's nice. So, I go in there. I love my dentist. He's a good friend. His name's Chad Allen. He's a great guy. And so Chad knows. I know at the top of my chart, they have a word written there. It's, it's, a, it's a medical word. They, they, the word is wussy. That's what they have written on my chart. <laughs> so I hate shots. You know, I'm like, yeah, you know. So they're just like, knock him out, get him high, you know, whatever we need to do, right? So they put the laughing gas on me, you know, and I'm like, yeah, this is the greatest dentist ever. <laughs> and they start giving me shots, you know. Anyway, so I'm waiting in the waiting room for a few minutes. And I'm not frustrated. It wasn't that long, but, but even though I'm waiting, I realize the reason I'm waiting is because they're getting stuff ready. So I'm not frustrated to wait because they're just they're preparing the instruments and getting everything ready before I come in. When you're waiting on God, don't think God's not moving. God's preparing things. He's getting things ready for you. He's opening doors you don't even know about yet. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. Let's have some faith, which means we believe in what we don't see yet. 
God's preparing things. All I heard was, I'm supposed to get high. No, you heard the wrong message. That's not it. Wait on God. God is moving on your behalf. Let's see what happens next. One of Jesse's sons, this is the, one of the assistants to King Saul at the time, he says, hey, one of Jesse's sons is a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war, and has good judgment. He's also a fine-looking young man. This is the second time we've heard that. So we already heard David's good-looking, right, when he shows up. Then we hear it again. Why does that matter? Like, if you're like me, you're like, what's the point? But God lets it be in Scripture for a reason. So I wonder if the reason it says that is because of the next line. He's a fine-looking young man, and it says, and the Lord is with him. Can I help you become better-looking? Walk with God. I'm just telling right now. Ladies, I know you have a nightly routine. I do too. My nightly routine involves bluebell ice cream, but that's a different nightly routine. <laughs> but I know you have a nightly routine. You know, you're like, I got to do what, get the makeup off, wash my face, put moisturizer on, all that stuff, right? You have a nightly routine. What if you made a part of your nightly routine to worship the Lord, to praise God, to read his word? That will improve your beauty like nothing else. Men, you probably have a nightly routine too. If you will spend some time with God instead of on that computer late at night, which is a bad place to be, if you will give God your time instead of screen time, watch God improve literally physically how you look. And so I just want to challenge you with this. This may sound simple or even silly, but it's a big deal. And why would they be, why would they be saying, hey, King, he's a good-looking dude. He's good-looking, looks like a warrior because he is a warrior. God's also with him. Why would he say all that to him? Because if you're going to come work for Saul, you're working for the kingdom. Can I tell you something? Again, I told you I was going to talk like a father. I'm going to talk like a father right now. Can I do that? I want to challenge everyone who can hear the sound of my voice. If you're watching online, if you're at one of our campuses, I want to challenge you tomorrow, dress a little nicer. Just whatever the event you're going to, dress one notch above it. Why would I say that? Because people will treat you and see you differently if you just look like you're going somewhere. You may say, I don't have any big plans. Look like you have big plans. Dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Unless you want to be in a Marvel movie, don't dress like Spider-Man. That'd be really weird. That, don't. The point is this. If you will begin to step it up a notch, it matters. The Bible says, and you say, oh, no, but the Bible says that God looks at the heart, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at Yeah, but man looks at the outward appearance. Which part of that is not Scripture? So it matters. Carry yourself in a way that says, I care to be here. Don't show up at work in your pajamas. Don't show up like you haven't showered in three days. Make sure that you come like you care. Does that make sense? I know this may seem simple. You may be, oh, this is not a big deal. I'm, look, I'm trying to talk to you as a father, giving you some wisdom right now. It matters. People look at that. When we have someone come in an interview and it looks like they just woke up, I'm like, what? Like the answer is, I don't even need to hear what you have to say. The answer is no. You don't care to be here. It matters. And so the way you present yourself says what you think about yourself and, who you, and what you think about the person you're presenting in front of. So it matters. Hey, students, don't sit in the back row in class. Sit in the front row. You just gave a loud and clear message. You know, there's a direct correlation between the A's to the D's from the front row to the back row. Did you know that? I can improve your grades right now. Just sit in the front. You're like, well, if I do that, i got to pay attention. Exactly. <laughs> I want to challenge you how you present yourself. Guys, I may be giving you the best advice you've gotten all year long. This will get you a raise, a promotion, an opportunity. It matters. It really does matter. Present yourself well. Why? You know why? You represent the kingdom too. You represent the kingdom of God. So please don't be sloppy. You represent Jesus. Unfortunately, people dress up nicer for the magic kingdom in Florida than we do the kingdom of God. So let's present ourselves well. I'm speaking more than you're amen to me right now. I'm just I'm preaching to you. I promise you this can change your life. It really can. So just... Think about how you present. It matters. And you say, oh, well, I mean, I'm, I wasn't born 6'2 and good looking. I wasn't either. But, but I can take what God's given me and present well. That's what I'm trying to say. Whatever God gave you, present well. That's a big deal that we learn to do that. So, so he says, hey, he, 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 he looks good. He's sharp. He's a man of war. You know, like, like this guy, you want him in, in, your, in your group, Saul. Then it says this. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, send me your son David the shepherd. So David began serving him. Saul loved David very much, and, and David became his armor bearer. His armor bearer, that means like he's laying out his, his clothes for war. You know how personal it is if you're laying out someone's clothes? That, that, takes, that tells me David was trustworthy. Like, I, if I trust you, 
you know how much I have to trust you to let you in my master bedroom? How many of you guys are like me? You're like, oh, no, I don't just let anyone in my house, let alone my bedroom, right? You better really trust someone. So Saul really trusted David, right? It says that he was his armor bearer. Whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Well, then, then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. So God allowed Saul to have a need that only David could meet. This opened a door for David. Let me also point out, it said that when, when he went to work for Saul, he served him. Guys, this was literally a palace. And let me just say right now, the fastest way into the palace is always through the servants' quarters. Whatever you want in life, serve people. If you will become a server, you will always be in demand. Serve others. It will change your life. You want to change your marriage? Just start serving your spouse. Just think, what can I do for my kids? What can I do for my community? How can I serve others? How can I serve my boss? How can I make them look good? How can I serve the customer better? If you'll begin to think like this, everything will change for you. I'm telling you right now, everything changes based upon you having a servant mentality. In fact, can I point something else out about this? This is a secondary gift of David. This isn't even his main gift. His main gift is shepherding. He's a warrior and a shepherd. Those go together. And so because you have to not only serve the sheep, but protect them from wolves, right? And this would come in handy because one day he would be serving the people of Israel and also protecting the people of Israel, also going out in battles. But this wasn't the gift he was using. The gift he was using was playing the harp. Now, he could have been like, I don't want to play the harp. I'm not taking that job. But he didn't do that. He realized, no, this is an opportunity. This is what the king needs. I'll, I'll give you what you need. I'll play the harp for you. And so can I tell you, all of us have to start off using a secondary gift before you get to use what you believe is your primary gift. So let me just encourage you. None of us start off at the top. No one. In fact, if you do, you'll probably mess it up, honestly. And so think about this. How many of you guys are, you know, maybe after church you're going to go out to eat, you're going to be served by a waiter or a waitress, right? That's probably not, in their mind, their ending of their career. Like, this is the coup de grace of what I want to do with my life. Probably not. They're serving while they're going to school, so one day they can get out of school, get that degree, and then use what they believe is their primary gift, right? But it's probably not certain. Now, there are some waiters and waiters that make $100,000 a year. They're incredible at it. That work in top-rated restaurants around the country and around the world. That's different. We're not talking about that. But let me just tell you right now, if you don't have the heart of a servant, and by the way, it always takes you longer than you think in those roles. You're always like, ah, oh, just wait, finally get done with school. It's taking me longer. And then I had this setback and that setback. We all had setbacks. And it takes longer to get where you want to go. Why? Why would God let you be set back spending more time doing the gift you don't want to use while you're waiting on to use the gift you do want to use? Why? Because God's trying to get it ingrained in you that when you finally get to do what you want to do, that you continue to have the heart of a servant. So David, when you're running the kingdom instead of working in the kingdom, it's your job as king not to lord it over people, but to serve people. What do you call people that are kings that lord over people? We call them evil dictators. They make it about themselves. I mean, how many times do we have to see leaders who get in a position of power and make it all about themselves? And so God says, no, I'm going to put you in a servant role, and I hope you never stop serving no matter how big your paycheck gets. Always make it about others serving people. Others. Somebody call Washington and let them know that. Would you do that? Would you do that? <laughs> Let's serve others. Make it about other people. It's such a critical thing. God wants to develop that servant spirit. I'm going to tell you a, a true story, a great story about a, a friend of mine named Richie. Rich and Gracie Acosta have been part of church a long time. They're amazing people. Rich, if he was here, I asked permission if I could say the story. And he said, absolutely. And uh, years ago, when he was a kid, he made some really foolish decisions, and he went to prison for it. He got out of prison. He was just a young man. He immediately met his wife. He said, that's the best thing ever happened to him. I would confirm that. They got married. But now he's trying to get work, and no one wants to hire an ex-con. He's like, man, I, I, he said, I couldn't get a job to save my life. I was trying, trying. You know, God's forgiven him. He, he, he served this time. But society's not so forgiving. So he could not find work. Finally, he's praying. They're coming to church here. He's praying. He says, God, I just don't know what to do. I just don't have any work. And this is what God tells him. God says, you have a truck. He had this old beat up truck. It's all he had to his name. And God said, you have a truck. And he's like, okay, God. So he thought, what can I do with my truck? So he called three or four friends and relatives and said, hey, I can't get work. If you need anything hauled off or no one you want that needs anything hauled off, I'll do it for a nominal fee. And that began his hauling business. He was just with his old truck. 
now rich and gracie, have a very successful business. He's got five massive dump trucks with the ability to lease up to 30, and he hauls off massive debris from huge construction sites. And so God has made him a very successful businessman, him and his wife both. Such a great story, but there's more to it. Years ago, we, we had a campaign we're doing, a giving campaign called the History Makers Campaign to build our broadcast building. And so all of us were called by God to, to give above and beyond our tithe. And they were tithing in their business, and God was blessing their business because of it. But he said, Pastor Bill, we're listening to you talk. And I love the story. He says that we were kind of freaked out. We're like, oh, man, you know, giving is, is not tithing. Tithing is returning what's already God's, the first 10% of all we have. Giving is above the 10%. He's like, you're talking about that? That challenged us. And he said, I turned to my wife. We're both, God's speaking to both of us. She says, I think we should give $25 a week above our tithe. A week. It's not a small amount of money, right? And he says, man, God put in my heart to give 50. And they realized God was telling them both, combine that number together. And they committed to God to give $75 every week above 10%. So the Lord, they're giving the first 10% and above $75. He said, Pastor Bill, we were scared to death. Didn't know how we were going to do it. I said, what happened? He said, our business exploded. See, when you become a giver above and beyond the tide, God's, God just stops heaven and says, oh, angels, hold on. See that person right down there in South Texas? They just became a giver. Bless them. And he began to bless their business like crazy. And then he said this. this. He said, Pastor, he said, from having a servant's heart, to having a giving heart, he said, we are now able to give what we used to earn annually. Don't tell me God doesn't come through for you when you shift your mindset, get your eyes off yourself, and start serving others. God will always more than return. You can't outgive God. You just can't do it. God always comes through. Take it from my friends, Rich and Gracie Costa, that God will bless you when you don't make your life about you. You say, I want to serve others. What's God put in your hand? It's just an old truck, but I'm going to use it for the glory of God. And then now he's got a bunch of trucks, and they're not so old anymore, and they're not so small. And so I want to encourage you in the same way. God will bless you. So number four, before you get to do what you want to do, you have to develop a heart of a servant. And when you do that, continue with that heart of the servant when God lets you do what you want to do. Now, after this story, here when, when, when he's serving uh, King Saul, they go to war. Saul sends David back to his dad to watch some sheep because he was really young, too young for the army. To this day in Israel, everyone serves in the army. I don't know if you knew that or not. They hit 18. They all start, after they graduate high school, they all go to the army for a couple years. So David, we know he's very young. He's probably 17, roughly. So he's not in the army yet. He goes back home. His dad says, hey, why don't you go check on your brothers? All of his brothers are older. They're all in the army. Go check on them. Take some food to them. So David's, you know, pizza boy delivery, right? He shows up. Hey, I'm supposed to give this to my brothers. He gives them the food. He knows that everyone in the army is hiding from some guy named Goliath. And God speaks in the spirit and you realize this is my chance. God told me I'm going to be the next king. And he hears the deal where the king says, anyone who kills Goliath gets to marry my daughter. You're now in the kingdom. You're now part of the family. He's like, this is my end right here. So he takes on Goliath. I'm going to skip that story even though it's amazing. I'm going to skip that story for now because I've shared that before. But he, of course, beats Goliath. He marries the king's daughter. Now he's in the kingdom. Now he's officially family. The problem is Saul's paranoid. And people start saying, they start singing a song that says, Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens, thousand, tens of thousands. Well, Saul didn't like hearing that at all. So now he is out to get David. Saul goes from loving David in one moment to wanting to kill him in the next. He literally started throwing spears at him randomly, like, what is going on? This guy's losing his mind. So David has to run for his life, literally. He has to run out of the castle to get away from him to spare his life. David's out in the wilderness, some other guys... Uh, that are also refugees like him, gather around him. He starts to build a little army, not to fight Saul, but to protect himself from Saul. Now, let's pick up a scripture, because this story, listen, listen, what I'm going to tell you next is the key piece to your graduation. You have to do what's next to graduate to the next opportunity, to the next promotion God has for you. I promise you this is so key. So let's jump into this. It says, Saul chose 3,000 elite troops and went to search for David and his men. Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. So he went to go to the bathroom. David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Think about that. So Saul has got to go to the bathroom. He's like, hey, you guys stay here. He goes, in, just for privacy, he goes in the, bath, in the cave thinking he's alone, sits down on the pot, 
I mean, this is what the story says, right? I mean, that's what he's doing. So we don't know if he's reading the paper, you know, I'm not sure what he's doing, right? So he's going to the bathroom. David has been right behind him. They're all sitting there going, that's, that's, that's Saul right there. They're like, I know, it's Saul. <laughs> they can't believe it. So David's men are like, this is our opportunity. You can kill him right now. You can't be more vulnerable than sitting on a pot. I mean, that is your opportunity. Now, we don't know if he was just casually reading the paper or he was having a dumb and dumber moment being like, oh, we're not sure. Either way, he's going to the bathroom. So check it out. This is so important. It says, the men, they immediately said this. David's men whispered to him, today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept up forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. That's how close he was. He literally got his knife, cut a piece of the robe so he could later hold it up and go, Saul, look. I was right by you. I could have killed you, and I didn't. That's why he did it. Cut a little piece off. It says this, but then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. Because they were all saying to him, David, you don't have to do it. We'll do it, and then we'll take the blame, and then you can become king. Like, this is easy. He's like, you're right. I didn't have to do it. I'll just turn a blind eye and let you guys do it. And I can say, I didn't kill him. I, I, I didn't break the law because the law is you can't kill a head of state, right? We had those laws of this day. And so he could have easily gotten away with this, but not with God. God was like, no, David, that's my anointed one. So David had to do the tough job, and maybe you've had to do this before, of protecting yourself from someone who's hurt you and also honoring them. Same person. You say, man, that's, that's complicated. Yep. And maybe you've been there. Let me just give you a couple of scenarios. I see it all the time. A father cheats on his wife. And now those kids, because of the father's decisions, they're like, well, he's my dad. But he also really hurt my mom and our family, blew everything up in our family. So how do I create a boundary so I don't become like that, but also honor my father, even though he makes really poor decisions? You know what I'm talking about? Some of you have had to face this. I, I pray you haven't, but I know many of you have. My, my, my mom and dad are not like this. I praise God. My mom and dad have honored God. I don't have to deal with this. But this is very common among families. Or maybe you work for a boss who's really just a jerk. They're all about themselves. But you prayed, and you're like, God, I don't need to get another job. I want to get away from this person. And God said, no, stay here. Work for them. And you're like, oh, but I can't stand them. And God's like, I know. Work for them. Why would God... Allow us to serve under someone who we don't even agree with. Why would God let that happen? Could it be that God's making sure that David understands when you don't honor me, you create messes for everyone under you? So God allows us to serve under a boss, under the authority of someone in our family, under someone in ministry, under someone in our local government or even the state or national government that we don't agree with. And God says, are you praying for them? Or are you just spouting off how much you can't stand them? Because you're supposed to pray for them. Oh, I know I'm stepping on some toes now. And so God convicts all of us to realize that we have to learn to honor authority even if we don't agree with them. So David was like, I don't agree with what Saul's doing, but he's still the king of Israel. I'm not going to honor the man. I'm going to honor the position. Did you catch that? Yeah, I know what he did is horrible, but he's still your dad. They're still your mom. I know what they're doing is not right, but they're still your boss. So we have to learn to honor them. So this may sound crazy to you, but this happened to me. I had to serve under someone I didn't agree with. They were abusive. They were difficult. They created a lot of messes that I had to go clean up myself. And I was like, God, I want to quit. I want to get out of here. And God's like, I know you want to quit, but I didn't tell you to quit. I didn't release you. You stay and you serve underneath them. And God taught me some powerful lessons from underneath a leader I did not agree with. I didn't talk about them. I didn't talk bad about them. I didn't spout off. I didn't do any of that. I had to honor them. God said, you stay put. And God taught me some lessons so that one day I could be the leader that I didn't have. You can be the dad you didn't have. You can be the boss you didn't have. Does that make sense? So God allows you to be under someone like that. So this may surprise you, but I really believe this. To graduate to your next level always starts with a full submission to the leadership you're under now. Now, I'm not saying that you're supposed to be abused. Please do not hear that. David, when he was physically in threat, God said, get out of there. So we're not suggesting, you know, wives don't say, oh, I'm supposed to submit to my husband as he hits me. No, no, we're not suggesting that. 
You may need to get out of there. But I want to encourage you, anything shy of that, you know, and I'm not talking about massive emotional abuse. Of course, I understand there's some, there's some limitations. I get it. Please do not think that. But I do believe that in our culture, nobody wants to talk about authority anymore. We all think we're our own authorities, and we wonder why our culture is a mess. God, God created lines of authority in the home, in the church, in communities, in workspaces, in our military, in education. And even when you don't agree, oh, I hate this for you because I know how hard it is, but I know God will honor this. If you will hang in there and submit to that authority, you have to get under what's over you so that one day you can be over what's actually going to be under you. Did you catch that? You have to be willing to submit fully to leadership even when you don't get it. Don't agree. If you'll do that, watch God bless you. Jesus himself went to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, is there any way I can pass this up? Is there any way I don't want to drink this, this cup? Will you say, is there any way I don't want to die? And the Father said to him, no. No, you got to do this. And he said, okay. And after Jesus fully submitted to the Father to the point of death on a cross, then his name became the highest name, the name above every name. Because he fully submitted, now we have a Savior. <laughs> Make sense? Would you bow your heads with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're in a tough season. You're like, man, Pastor, oh, this is what I wanted to hear. I get it. I totally understand. But there's a season where you learn to serve in difficulty. God will develop you through this season. If you learn to do that, Pastor, I don't agree with the direction my husband's going. I know. But if you'll just honor him, God will get him. God will get him, ladies. He'll get, him, he'll get his attention. Pastor, I'm serving under a boss I don't agree with. God says, I got him. I know your boss. I know him well. I made him. I can take care of that. You just honor me. You honor me by serving underneath them. You're not honoring them. You're honoring the Lord by honoring the authority that you're under. Pastor, I don't agree with the direction of our ministry. Well, if God called you here, I'm going to ask you to serve. Maybe, maybe you don't agree with the direction of our country. Well, I don't, I don't always agree either, but I'm still going to honor this country. I'm still going to pray for my president. I'm still going to pray for our leadership. You don't like it, vote differently. That's fine. But I want to challenge you. Let's submit what God's called us to submit to. God will bless that. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to encourage you in this prayer time. If you've never given your life to Jesus, you can receive him right now by praying a very simple prayer. It's not complicated. It's incredibly simple to become a Christian. You just simply trust that Jesus died for you, that he rose again, and you trust your life in his hands. Pray this prayer with me right now across all of our campuses. You can pray this prayer. You can say, Dear Jesus, I realize I need you. I believe you died for my sin. And I believe you rose again. I ask you to come into my heart, be my Lord, and be my Savior. I repent of my sins. I put you in first place. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you just receive Christ in your life, would you hold your hand high right now? At all of our campuses, just hold your hand high. Praise God. We see your hands. Hold them high. Hold them high. Hold them up just a moment longer. All of our campuses right now, hold your hand high. Praise God. Praise God. We thank you. We thank God for the decision you made to give your life to Jesus. If you're watching online with us right now, you can let us know by just texting in the text chat. Just say, my hand's raised, or click, hand raised, right now. Father, thank you for what you're doing in this place. Thank you, God, for those who just gave their life to Christ. And thank you, Lord, for your message is clear. God, that we have to be faithful in the wait. You have a plan for us. If we'll just trust in your timing and your way, you will open a door when you say it's time. So we love you. We fully submit to your leadership, Lord. And we thank you, God, that you have great things in, in our future. We trust in your timing. In your name we pray. Amen. And God good? His word is so true.